in nature do the experiment. So identifying signatures and genomes that reflect these ongoing processes of evolution. So the basic approach is characterize natural variation on the genome scale, not just using 16S, but using the entire genome. And then apply population genomic rules to understand how, the, how that variation arose and is shaped by different factors in the environment. So population genomics being applied to microbial genomes is, um, it, it comes with us an interesting set of problems because, as I hope people know, um, there's the mi microbial pan genome, of pan genome of a species, is made up of two components. The first component is the core genome, and this is the set of, um, of genes that are shared by all strains of a species. And in the diagram that I have here, it's, this is these, these blue lines, these light, thin light blue lines. So everybody in the species has those genes, and that's called the core genome. It's what makes um, E. coli E. coli or Sulfalobus Sulfalobus. So we know pretty well from using um, the history of studying natural variation and population genomics in the charismatic macrofauna like yeast and, and plants and animals, what, how this natural variation is shaped. So we know that variation is introduced by mutation or it can be moved around or introduced by recombination and migration. And then the natural variation in the population is removed by selection or genetic drift. So if we think about how all of these different factors interact with each other, we can infer from looking at patterns of variation what's happened in terms of mutation, recombination, migration, selection, and drift, and how those have interacted. So we know in the core genome how to infer those, those interactions based on patterns of variation. What I find particularly complicated about looking at, at microbial genomes is looking at the variable genome, or some people call it the flexible genome. And this is the set of genes that's not shared among strains. And what's so complicated about it is that it's often associated with viruses or other mobile elements like plasmids or conjugate plant transposons or things like that. And so what, what the rules for studying population genomics change a little bit because now we have two interacting evolutionary units, the host and the virus, the host and the plasmid. Each one of those has its own population dynamics. It has its own mutational selection, drift, population size, migration, recombination patterns. And then it also has the interaction between the core genome and itself. Then those rules together is what establishes the patterns in the variable genome. So when you start to think about population biology in microbial systems, you have to include both the core and the variable genome and think about the rules of symbiosis. So that now we take characterized variation and apply the rules of symbiosis and population biology to try to infer and understand those patterns. So this isn't unique to microorganisms. Every organism on earth is infected by a virus. You're infected by a virus. I'm infected by viruses. Every organism on earth is infected by viruses. And so understanding this interaction between the core genome, which we've studied for a long time, and this variable genome is not unique to microorganisms or any particular microorganism. It's something that we have to think about in general in terms of population biology. But there's a problem, which is that we can't, we don't have any marker. So 16S ribosomal RNA really changed how we saw the relationships uh, in mi microorganisms because although we couldn't see them, we could use their gen gene content in terms of their genomes or their 16S ribosomal RNA to understand their relationships. But in viruses, we can't do that because they don't all share a common set of loci in their genome. So there's no one marker we can use to track viruses of any of these domains. So we can observe them, we can look at them, but we can't really tell what their relationships are. So this is taking us back pre-WOS in terms of how to look at and think about 
evolution of this evolutionary unit, the evolutionary unit that's in viruses and plasmids. Luckily for us, though, the um, microbes have come up with their own surveillance system for tracking and following viruses. And we are going to talk about using that system to track viruses in a minute. But so I just want to introduce that, which is the CRISPR-Cas system. So the CRISPR-Cas system um, has gotten a lot of attention recently for its use in genetic engineering. But of course, it originally evolved in microbes as a way to combat viruses. And so I have an example here in this picture to, show, to walk you through how that works. So a virus, like this virus here, gets in, infects a cell, like this host cell here. And when it infects the host cell at some frequency, the host cell adds what's called a spacer, a new spacer on the end of this repeat spacer locus, which is a tandem array of repeats and spacers. And when it adds a spacer that matches a piece of the virus genome, and then on subsequent infection, it can recognize that virus genome. So this fantastic adaptive immune system allows the host to recognize viruses in a sequence-specific manner. When it matches these uh, incoming viruses, it's able to specifically target and degrade the genome to prevent infection. So this CRISPR-Cas system has been shown in many different microorganisms to protect cells against infection from viruses. What we found most appealing from it at first was this: the fact that each time the host cell gets infected with the virus, it's adding a new sequence onto its CRISPR repeat spacer array. So that means we can look in the genomes of the host organism to track its evolutionary history of interactions with virus. It interacted with the green virus, the pink virus, the orange virus, the purple virus, and the blue virus, and most recently this light blue virus in this schematic. So that's recording a history of diversity of viruses that are interacted with and something about their re the, how recently they interacted. This is also a fantastic system because if you take all the repeat spacer, if you take all the spacer loci, excuse me, that are in the um, locus and compare them back to genomes, you can use them to identify new viruses because pieces of the virus are recorded in the history. And we are using that to profile virus um, integrations in different systems. And so here's an example of that. So we can use CRISPRs to profile um, and identify new elements. So say there's a strain that has a virus integrated into it as a provirus. And we have a database of all the spacers that, of all the strains that have ever seen that virus. We can take that database of spacers and map it back to the genomes and identify new elements without knowing anything about their genomes. We would know that they had interacted with that host and had been recorded in the CRISPR spacer loci. So we're using this to what we call prototype different strains to show not only their evolutionary history of interactions, but also to identify which strains are infected with which types of viruses. So that gives us the, um, the natural variation we need to be able to follow viruses. And I think it's really going to open up the ability to track virus interactions in natural populations. I think it might give us a handle on being able to track the diversity and the patterns of diversity in different populations. But then what we need beyond being able to establish that natural variation is to understand the rules of symbiosis. So in order to understand what those patterns mean, we need to understand how those interactions are happening. So here's what we think is what we know about virus-host interactions at this stage. So a group, we have a set of viruses that interact with a host. The host can be susceptible, resistant, or immune. So if it's susceptible, it gets infected by a virus. If it's resistant, it does not get infected by a virus. 
And if it's immune, it also does not get infected by a virus because this adaptive immune system prevents infection. So we know now something about these, um, these interactions of the, of the virus and the host. But what about the infection that comes later? What about the outcome of this interaction? We know from many, many years, tens of years of studying virus-host interactions in, in both eukaryotes and bacteria and archaea to somewhat, that viruses can infect host cells and kill them. So symbiosis, has, there's a range of symbiosis from pathogen to mutualist, and we know a lot about the pathogen side. In fact, um, thinking, most often thinking, we think of viruses and phage as predators or killers in, in a population. So when they infect a host cell, they lyse that cell and go on to then infect new cells. But we know from genome, looking at genomes that there's another outcome of interaction, which can be chronic infection. And there's many examples now that are arising of how chronic infection can shape the physiology of the host cell. So the host cell can be chronically infected by a virus, be producing it, either, as, either be producing it as a chronic infection that's being shed over time, or as a latent infection where it's not being, it's not, the virus is not being produced. But the presence of that virus in the host genome can expand the niche of the host, can, can give new metabolisms, or can alter the host's physiology. So I think that, the, that viruses span these interactions from mutualistic to pathogen um, and back again. So we know some of the outcomes of this interaction. And if you put that into our rules of symbiosis then, you get the outcome of this interaction that leads to a, suscept a susceptible cell either to death, usually through lysis, or to a chronic infection where they produce more virus that then can go and infect new hosts. So this is what we can apply, these rules we can apply to looking at nat our natural variation in order to understand the evolutionary principles of how that pan genome is shaped. But if you think about it, and that tree that I showed before, there's so many different viruses, there's so many new viruses being discovered. We in my lab were starting to think about, and others are too, what, what is, what, is this it? Is this the only things that can happen when a host interacts with a virus? Given the diversity of viruses that have been recently discovered, there might be new rules. There might be rules that we haven't uncovered microorganisms to protect cells against infection from viruses. What we found most appealing from it at first was this, the fact that each time the host cell gets infected with the virus, it's adding a new sequence onto its CRISPR repeat spacer array. So that means we can look in the genomes of the host organism to track its evolutionary history of interactions with virus. It interacted with the green virus, the pink virus, the orange virus, the purple virus, and the blue virus, and most recently this light blue virus in this schematic. So that's recording a history of diversity of viruses that are interacted with and something about their re the, how recently they interacted. This is also a fantastic system because if you take all the repeat spacer, if you take all the spacer loci, excuse me, that are in the um, locus and compare them back to genomes, you can use them to identify new viruses because pieces of the virus are recorded in the history. And we are using that to profile virus um, integrations in different systems. And so here's an example of that. So we can use CRISPRs to profile um, and identify new elements. So say there's a strain that has a virus integrated into it as a provirus. And we have a database of all the spacers that, of all the strains that have ever seen that virus. We can take that database of spacers and map it back to the genomes and identify new elements without knowing anything about their genomes. We would know that they had interacted with that host and had been recorded in the CRISPR spacer loci. 
So we're using this to what we call prototype different strains to show not only their evolutionary history of interactions, but also to identify which strains are infected with which types of viruses. So that gives us the, um, the natural variation we need to be able to follow viruses, and I think it's really going to open up the ability to track virus interactions in natural populations. I think it might give us a handle on being able to track the diversity and the patterns of diversity in different populations. But then what we need beyond being able to establish that natural variation is to understand the rules of symbiosis. So in order to understand what those patterns mean, we need to understand how those interactions are happening. So here's what we think is what we know about virus-host interactions at this stage. So a group, we have a set of viruses that interact with a host. The host can be susceptible, resistant, or immune. So if it's susceptible, it gets infected by a virus. If it's resistant, it does not get infected by a virus. And if it's immune, it also does not get infected by a virus because this adaptive immune system prevents infection. So we know now something about these, um, these interactions of the, of the virus and the host. But what about the infection that comes later? What about the outcome of this interaction? We know from many, many years, tens of years of studying virus-host interactions in, in both eukaryotes and bacteria and archaea to somewhat, that viruses can infect host cells and kill them. So symbiosis, has, there's a range of symbiosis from pathogen to mutualist, and we know a lot about the pathogen side, in fact, um, thinking, most often thinking, we think of viruses and phage as uh, predators or killers in a, in a population. So when they infect a host cell, they lyse that cell and go on to then infect new cells. But we know from geno looking at genomes that there's another outcome of interaction which can be chronic infection. And there's many examples now that are arising of how chronic infection can shape the physiology of the host cell. So the host cell can be chronically infected by a virus, be producing it, either as either be producing it as a chronic infection that's being shed over time, or as a latent infection where it's not being, it's not the virus is not being produced. But the presence of that virus in the host genome can expand the niche of the host, can can give new metabolisms, or can alter the host's physiology. So I think that the, that viruses span these interactions from mutualistic to pathogen um, and back again. So we know some of the outcomes of this interaction. And if you put that into our rules of symbiosis then, you get the outcome of this interaction that leads to a, suscept a susceptible cell either to death, usually through lysis, or to a chronic infection where they produce more virus that then can go and infect new hosts. So this is what we can apply, these rules we can apply to looking at nat our natural variation in order to understand the evolutionary principles of how that pan genome is shaped. But if you think about it, and that tree that I showed before, there's so many different viruses, there's so many new viruses being discovered. We in my lab were starting to think about, and others are too, what, what is, what, is this it? Is this the only things that can happen when a host interacts with a virus? Given the diversity of viruses that have been recently discovered, there might be new rules. There might be rules that we haven't uncovered yet. And so we're going to talk about one of those now. Particularly, we were interested in the interactions of that chronically infected host cell. So you can see now I've drawn it in here. This is a chronically infected host that was susceptible. It got infected. Now how does this chronically infected host interact with an uninfected host? And how does that change the population biology of the system overall? That has not been looked at very well in any system. So our model system that we decided to look at is Sulfalobus Icelandicus. It's, um, it's a hyperthermophilic 
Kynarchaeon that lives in geothermal hot springs at a pH of 380 degrees Celsius. And you can see some pictures here of um, Sulfalobus interacting with viruses and also the environments where we collect uh, Sulfalobus and have collected many Sulfalobus over time. So here's us collecting in collaboration with some uh, geochemists that we work on who are taking the geochemical parameters of that hot spring that we're sampling. It's a good model system for looking at natural variation and applying population biology rules because it lives in island populations. So island populations are extremely tractable for doing this type of population genomics. And one of the big reasons they are is because there's a system of natural replicates. If you're trying to understand um, not nature's experiment, you need to look at nature's replicates of that experiment and see how they're different. So we don't have controls in our natural experiment, but we can look at the differences between different island populations and infer then how the geochemistry or the virus population or the community is shaping the population. And only in where we have island populations that are constrained um, by their boundaries of, their, of the hot spring can we do this kind of direct link between the population and the environment. So we, over time, have, have shown that there's island populations from Yellowstone, Iceland, and Kamchatka, and that these are isolated by distance, meaning that they're evolving independently from one another. So they represent our natural replicates in the system. And from those, we've sequenced many, many genomes, over, over 100 now, um, from different populations, and used these population genetic tools to compare them to each other. We've also isolated many different viruses from these different locations and are now working on mapping that interaction back onto the population variation that we see. So in these different populations, we see different patterns of interactions. We see that in when we look at the CRISPR spacer loci that's recording interactions with viruses, we see a difference between what they've seen and interacted with in Yellowstone versus what they've seen and interacted with in Kamchatka. So each of these little diamonds represents a different type of virus that's been, that has left a spacer in that host and and that means has interacted with that host. And you can see there's a lot of red diamonds up here, while there's a lot of more of these light um, blue diamonds down in the Kamchatka population. So the, the, there's an overrepresentation in the Yellowstone population of these viruses called SIRB, and an overrepresentation relative to the other replicate population of SSV in Kamchatka. And so we're going to talk about now the interaction between Sulfalobus Icelandicus and SSV um, because we were interested in that difference in between our replicate populations. So we're going to focus mostly on one population, this population from Kamchatka, Russia. And you can see this population that we've sampled in 2000 and in 2010. And what we did was go in with our usual starting point, taking strains and viruses out of this population, bringing them home, sequencing their genome, culturing them, sequencing their genomes, and looking at patterns of natural variation. And I think we have a pretty good handle on those patterns now. Um, in that we know what type of variation there are. And what we found out is that there's a lot of diversity in the CRISPR loci, meaning there's very, very many different immune profiles among different strains, and that that diversity is stable over time. Many CRISPR spacers in this population match to that virus SSV. And we've all, all also found that something like 20% of the host that we've sequenced or surveyed with, um, with molecular tools are infected by SSV at one time. So we know what those patterns of, of natural variation are, but we wanted to understand the rules of this symbiosis so that we could infer why those patterns look the way they did in this population and maybe why they look different in the other population that we were looking at. So we decided to focus on one virus. This is it. It's called SSV9. This is a genome. It's about 17 KB. And we found out that SSVs 
like their hosts, are geographically isolated. So there's different populations of SSVs in different locations. And this is, one is from Kamchatka. Um, on to here, we've mapped the core, the pan genome of SSV, which shows the core genes in, in dark blue, the uh, variable genes in yellow, and the genes that are unique to this strain in pink. So you can see that it has this core genome and this variable genome. Um, and, um, but we still don't know how it interacts with the hosts. So this was the project of Maria Bautista, who's listening here. And from here on out, um, she can tune in and answer questions. This is her work looking at this interaction between hosts from Sulfolobus Icelandicus um, from this one population from Kamchatka, Russia. And we're going to look at 12 strains, all isolated from a single hot spring there, and how they interact with one virus, SSV9. So SSV is a fusillovirus that has a circular double-stranded genome. As I showed you, it ranges around um, 17 kb, average of 17 kb. And it sometimes site-specifically integrates into the tRNAs of the host genome, but not always. And it is a chronic virus that buds off of its host. Um, so it gets established as a, car a carrier population gets established that sheds virus over time. But as you're shedding virus, you don't die. And so um, it's not thought to be lytic or even deadly. It's just shed off of the host at some, at some rate, of infected host at some rate. And again, we're going to use this set of strains that we isolated from one hot spring and compare interactions between SSV9 and these strains. So Maria started out with this set of 12 strains. And um, we've looked closely at these strains, and we know that they're two different species. This is one of the species that exists in this population. And this is a second species that exist in this population. And on to the diversity of this population, we mapped who had was infected by a virus. And so you can see these two strains here, strain 12 and 22, are infected by a provirus, an SSV provirus. And then we looked at um, whether or not they had space CRISPR spacers that matched that virus, SSV9, that we were going to focus on. And you can see that some have spacers, and some do not have spacers. So Maria took the SSV9, and she spotted it on all these different strains and looked for what the interaction looked like. And what she noticed was that there were resistant strains, as we had predicted from the level of interactions that we saw. There were susceptible strains. But then there were also these transient strains that had a plaque that formed at one day, a, a, a slowing of growth at one day, but didn't see any plaque it, uh, later at, the, at day two. So she was interested in how this transient phenotype mapped onto the strains that we'd sequenced. And so she looked at that in relation to proviruses and to spacers, SSV9 uh, spacers, and found that there was a correlation between the strains that had this interesting transient phenotype and those that had spacers to match SSV9. So these three strains all had this transient phenotype. They all had spacers. This one did not have a spacer, and it was susceptible. It made this zone of clearing after it was in, after we had spotted SSV9 onto a lawn of Sulfolobus Icelandicus. We also had resistant strains, and um, these t two of these were our, those strains that were already infected by SSV9. So Maria became interested in how the interaction between CRISPR spacers and this um, transient phenotype. And at the time, we had just gotten a set of genetic tools that were developed by a postdoc in my lab, Chang Yi Zhang. And so he looked at one strain of uh, Sulfolobus Icelandicus from this population in Kamchatka and made a genetically tractable model out of it. And that strain is M16-4. So what he did was he, so since Maria wanted to test how the um, immune system was affecting this phenotype, we decided to knock out the immune system of Sulfolobus Icelandicus and see how that changed, whether that changed that interaction. 
So what he did was he knocked out the CRISPR, the Cas1 gene, and the uh, oh, I should say first that the um, that the repeat spacer M164 has two repeat spacer arrays. This is one of them. This is the second one, A2. The A1 a repeat spacer array has an exact CRISPR spacer match to our virus, SSV9, with a protospacer associated motif. So 16, M164 should be immune to this virus if it's working. It also has a type 1A CRISPR-Cas system, which um, is a DNA interference system, and it's encoded here, which uh, in over on this side of the locus, which has the cascade, which does the actual processing and interference when there's a match between a CRISPR spacer and a genome, and Cas6, which is important for processing of the um, CRISPR transcript. It also has an acquisition cassette that allows the acquisition of new spacers, um, and that is the main core Cas gene, Cas1, is important for the acquisition of new spacers. Okay, so going back to Cheng Yi, what Cheng Yi did was decide to knock out, as a control, the uh, repeat spacer locus that did not contain the spacer match to the virus, and the Cas1 gene, which was important for adding new spacers. So this strain, we predicted, would be immune to the SSV9 virus because it still had the machinery that was important for, pro for recognizing and interfering with infection, and it also had the CRISPR spacer match. And then he knocked out that system by um, knocking out the A1 locus, which contained the repeat spacer, and the rest of the system, the type 1A uh, cascade, he knocked out Cas3, which cannot work, which cannot interfere um, with a virus, a recognized virus, without that, and the Cas6 uh, gene. And the prediction here is that these blue strains would be immune deficient. So then Cheng Yi gave those strains to Maria, and what she did was mix the cells, whoa, sorry about that, mix the cells with SSV9 and incubate for five hours. Now, SSV9 is a wild virus. We don't get it produced very much in the lab, and so she did this infection at a very low multiplicity of infection, which is between 0.01 and 0.1, either genomes or PFUs uh, per host cell. So that means one in 10 or one in 100 host cells are going to see an infectious virus particle. So she took the, she infected those cells, incubated those cells with the virus for five hours, and then washed the virus away, removed all unabsorbed particles, and then resuspended in fresh media and followed the cultures over time, taking the viral the virus fraction to quantify viral DNA by qPCR and by uh, plaque forming units on a susceptible host and then tracking the host population by growing it and tracking its o change in OD600 and viable colleague counts and by looking at them in TEM. And what she found with this, uh, with this set of mutants that Cheng Yi had made is that the predictions were correct. So if you can see here, this is a graph that shows over time, the change in plaque forming units per mil in the supernatant and the change in viral genomes per mil um, in the supernatant over time, measured by qPCR. So you can see that the blue strains, which are all the immune deficient strains, got infected by SSV9, and SSV9 was produced in the culture. This goes from zero, essentially, to about 10 to the fourth. Um, PFUs per mil, and this is on the order of the MOI, so at this point there's about 1 in 100 or 1 in 10 um, vir infectious virus particles in these infected cultures.
The immune strain, the um, immune strains, however, were able to protect themselves against infection, and you can see that there is no productive infection established in these immune cells. There's no virus that's produced, and the number of genomes degrades over time, just like it would in media that there were no hosts in. So. The immune cells and the immune and so our predictions about the immune system were correct in this in this case. Okay, what about the growth of these cells over time? So this is where Maria got kind of a surprise. We looked at the difference between the immune deficient cells and the immune cells as compared to the no virus controls and found that there was a very big difference in the way they grew. The immune deficient cells basically didn't grow at all. They didn't change in OD over time. They didn't, the OD didn't go down, but it also didn't go up over time. The immune cells had a growth delay for 24 to 48 hours and then resumed growth normally. While the no infection controls grew straight off the bat and were able to, to reproduce as quickly, um, to reproduce as if the virus wasn't there, because it wasn't. So this was a surprise because there's a difference between the growth of the immune cells and the growth of the immune deficient cells that we couldn't really explain. Why, if there's no virus infection in this culture, is there a delay of growth for 24 to 48 hours? So to look at this, we looked more carefully into uh, the, the cultures and first took, wanted to know whether those cells were, whether the immune deficient cells were dying. So she took the immune deficient cells and looked in TEM over time and found that there was a difference between this, what the cells looked like when they were challenged with virus as compared to when they were not challenged with virus. You can see over here that the cells right away look pretty sick. They have this um, very different appearance from the, from the growing cells um, and she called this phenotype empty. To quantify the number of empty cells, she looked at these TEM grids and counted how many empty cells there were in this, um, in this immune deficient culture challenge with SSV9 over time and found that the empty cells increased to almost 100% of the culture um, over time. So they, all, so they look really different over time by 48 hours, almost the entire culture um, of cells looks empty. And these cells, even though they aren't lysed, were dying. So this explains that constant um, optical density over time. So the, um, the, the, you can see here the colony forming units, which estimates the number of viable cells compared, um, compared between the no virus and the virus exposed um, strains. So you can see here that the no virus strains, immune deficient strains grow normally over time, where the number of viable cells increases over time, whereas the, vi the virus infected cells, uh, exposed cells go down. So although, while 100% of the cells look like they are um, empty, nearly 100% have, uh, nearly 100% have died, so only not about 1% of the culture would be viable at 48 hours. So that's what dead cells look like. And then she looked at the, uh, um, at the immune cells and was surprised to find that they looked the same way. So here's our, our wild type immune cell challenged with virus, um, with no virus and, and virus. So you can see that the no virus looks about the same, whereas the ones that were challenged by SSV9 have this empty appearance at 12, 24, and 48 hours, but then seem to recover and look normal at 72 hours. So again, she quantified the number of empty cells and found that it's 24 hours, almost 100% still had this, this phenotype of being empty. But then Maria was surprised to find that while in the other culture, in the immune deficient culture, that empty phenotype had been associated with dead cells, in the immune phenot in the immune strain, that empty phenotype was not associated with dead cells. These cells were able to grow. They have the same number of colony forming units of viable cells at uh, 24 hours, even though almost 90% of the cells have this phenotype. 
So this is a phenotype that we call dormant because they are not growing. Our ODs did not go up and had this delayed growth phenotype. But they're also not dying. They're still viable. Um, so um, you can see that that number is constant over time. And then the cells recover and start to grow. But we had a problem at this point because we knew that now that the immune cells were going dormant but the, um, and the non-immune deficient cells were getting infected and dying, but we didn't under, what we didn't understand was the relationship between the number of virus particles that were there and the number of cells that were responding to the virus particles. So I told you that there was um, 1 in 10 to 1 in 100 viruses per cell, host cell. Um, and yet, I also showed you that 95% of the cells responded to those viruses. So they either went dormant or died over time. And so Maria developed this hypothesis that maybe the dormancy, dormancy was independent of productive virus infection. And so to test that uh, hypothesis, she UV inactivated SSV9 so that it could not produce a new infection. And when she challenged our immune deficient strains and our immune strains with the UV inactivated virus, she found that both the immune and the immune deficient cells um, had a growth delay but were able to recover over time. So here you see there's no, the no virus was able to grow just as we would expect and the UV inactivated um, virus particles caused a delay in growth um, and then the, both the immune and immune deficient cells were able to recover. So just the virus, the virus particles or whatever was in the supernatant associated with the virus particles at that time was causing this growth delay. It was not the infection by the virus that was causing this growth delay. But now we had another problem because 99% of the immune deficient cells died when they were challenged by this, um, by the active virus. And so we wondered if that was in relationship to um, staying dormant over time. So remember that most of the cells, the uh, SSV challenge cells, went, um, were, died after uh, 48 hours. And also, at 48 hours, the immune deficient cells were producing virus. So Maria's hypothesis was that the immune deficient cells got infected by that virus. A few, maybe 1 in 10 to 1 in 100 cells, got infected and are producing virus over time. And the constant presence of that virus in the culture is keeping the host cells dormant and making them die over time. So to test this, she decided to inactivate the virus, but simulate the infection. So she UV inactivated the SSV9 virus and added it to the host cells three times over the course of the infection. So she did her normal five-hour um, challenge with virus, and then again at 24 and 48 hours, so that she could simulate this infection process that we'd seen in the immune deficient cells. And when she saw that, did that, she indeed found that the host, the immune and the immune deficient cells died. So here you see the growth of the immune and the immune deficient on these three different challenges. And you can see that even the immune cells don't grow and they in fact die over time when they're persistently exposed to SSV9. So vi viral replication did not occur in these cultures. The, UV, the virus was inactivated. But the addition of the virus um, containing supernatant caused three times over the course of this infection caused the host cells to die. So here's our model for this interaction now, and we call it virus induced dormancy um, and death. So the immune cells challenged by the SSV9 virus were able to get rid of the virus in the culture and even though they looked like they were dormant or empty they were able to recover and grow normally and the virus went away. The immune deficient cells um, also went dormant when challenged by this virus and a few of them got infected because they are immune deficient and produced new virus and the present, continuous present of that, presence of that virus killed um, the other immune deficient cells that were in the culture. So 
to back up this model, we also find that 100%, almost 100% of the cells that are challenged by virus once they regrow at the end after they, everybody has died are infected. So infected cells can grow normally, but they produce this death in uninfected cells. So getting back to our rules of symbiosis and how we can interpret the patterns of natural variation that we see, we're arguing that we need to now include a new um, interaction, which is that when a vi when the virus, and this is SSV9, comes into contact with the host, it can, it can infect a susceptible cell. There may be some resistant cells. If there's immune, there's no infection. But also, the host cell is going to go dormant and eventually die if that virus persists. Infected cells, susceptible cells, can get infected. And in this system, those guys don't die. But the chronic infection, infected cells produce more virus that then causes uninfected cells to go dormant or die. And so you can see that there's an interaction here mediated by the virus between the chronically infected cells and the, and the hosts. So just as Maria and I had thought, there is, are these new interactions, and these new interactions are really changing the way we apply the rules of symbiosis to understand patterns of natural variation. So I think the bottom line here is that just by looking at one virus and one host, we were able to identify a very new set of rules of symbiosis in this sulfalova system. And how many more are there going to be? In order to understand the impact of viruses and hosts uh, and their hosts on evolution in in any in any organism on Earth, we're going to have to really take apart and understand some uh, some more of these rules of symbiosis. And once we understand that, we're going to be able to look at natural variation and predict how viruses are shaping natural uh, populations. So our suggestion from this is that we need to look more deeply into more interactions between wild viruses and their hosts because we haven't figured out all the rules of symbiosis. We looked at one virus-host pair and we uncovered a completely new set of rules that lead to dormancy and death in an affection-independent way. And if, everybody, and if everybody would look at virus-host interactions, we probably would cover a lot more of interactions that, um, and, and uncover a lot of different new surprises. Okay, so I just want to thank uh, members of my lab. You can see here Maria is Maria Batista, and she's the one that did all of this work on dormancy. And it took a long time, so t taming vi uh, wild viruses is not easy. Um, and establishing these new interactions is complicated with not a lot to go on. And so it takes a lot of work to do that, and um, although we need to do it, it's hard. Um, and Maria persisted in doing that um, and has ended up with a fantastic PhD because of it. And this is Chang Yi Zhang, a uh, postdoc who made all of the, of the mutants and is interested in um, making more and looking at patterns of natural variation and how we can test them using genetic models. And this is the rest of my lab. They all work together very well um, to help figure out problems like this and, and apply patterns of natural variation um, and, and come up with new rules to understand them. Um, I also want to thank collaborators, especially Mark Young, who has um, really brought me into this field of looking at viruses and, and natural populations of sulfalobus. And without him, I never would have been able to do this type of project. And we have funding from NASA and from NSF that's allowed us to keep going. So with that, I would love to take any questions. And I think I'm going to stop sharing. Cool. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. That was really, really interesting. Uh, this uh, is in the lab from the from the seminar. I have a question now, too, about your choices. So, obviously, it depends on your culture, and you guys have done a good job of creating a genetic system. Were your cells naturally competent, or did you have to do anything to, to, to force this genetic tractability to happen? They're not naturally co 
confident we can, once we had the markers though, we can uh, electroporate them with, um, with, a, with an engineered plasmid to get DNA in. Okay. So they're, they're susceptible to that electroporation. Yep. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if, if you know, our, you have all this little strain by strain variation, if there's any, if there's any differences between the ability to make these, these tractable within that, within that population. That's a good question, and we're working on trying to make it, uh, Chengyi is working on developing broadly applicable tools, so we're starting to use the CRISPR-Cas systems that have been developed, the native CRISPR-Cas system, to um, make genetic knockouts. Um, this has been developed by, by, um, by other labs, and we're trying to use that, and that should be a broad, but we still need to be able to have markers, and so making the initial strains that we're working on has been a challenge. But we're trying to come up with broadly applicable tools, and that will help us a lot more. Yeah. We've engineered, I think now we have three different strains that we've engineered knockouts in that we can use as genetic models. And of course, we're using a diversity of strains to establish as our models because we're trying to be informed by the natural variation. So. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? So I'll jump in. Um, I had a question about the empty phenotype. So what's actually happening in the cell? And, and when you're calling it empty, I mean, is it filled with something? Or is it a gas vacuole? Or like, what is what is the empty? So that is a, that's a great question. We're working on figuring it out now. It's just what the cells look like after they're exposed to you know, the processing that we need to do for the section and for TEM looks really different. The cells look really different. We don't know whether it's the processing that makes them look different. Um, but there's definitely a difference between the, um, the wild type act actively growing cells and the ones that were challenged with virus. So whatever that difference is, it looks different in TEM. We don't know what that is yet. We really don't. And, and just to be clear, so it was giving you that phenotype even with the inactivated virus. Yes. So you said it was a supernatant. Is it all the protein and all the DNA then? Yeah. Huh. Do you think that the do you think that the cells like consume the viruses or how do they clear it? You know, how do you go from dormant, filled with virus to some period of time later you're you're good? It's like, not what, what filled with virus. It's so the dormant cells are not filled with virus. They are, um, they've been exposed to the virus supernatant. So there's only one in 10 to 1 in 100 cells that are going to even potentially be infected. Okay, okay. And we think, because of the difference between the immune deficient and immune cells, that the immune cells clear that infection. They, they target the DNA of the, of the virus when it comes in and, and degrade it. Okay. Okay. So they're not. They're not. I, I misunderstood. I thought they were filling up too, and then they were just waiting it out. No, well, they, yeah, they do. They look empty, but yeah. it's not because there's virus in there. Oh. So they also wait it out and then recover, and we don't know. Since we don't know what the waiting it out dormancy part is, we don't really know what the recovery looks like either. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we're we're trying to think about you know, toxin antitoxin systems and things that would trigger the cell to go into this like, altered state and then be able to recover after over time. Okay. Like anaphylactic shock. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's really weird. Um, yeah, we have we have some hypotheses we're working on, but it's it's um, it's a difficult problem to approach because there's heterogeneity in the culture, so like one in a hundred or one in ten are going to see that virus, and they may have a different phenotype than the guys that have this kind of indirect effect of whatever, whatever is causing them to go dormant. So we're working on taking those apart. Are there any other questions, either inside the Hangout or for anyone watching? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, hey, uh, great talk. I have two questions, actually. So first is more technical. How do you get, um, how do you know that you work with just one type of virus in your setups? Oh, and that one type of virus is produced? Uh, yeah, and, and that the bacterium doesn't contain any 
any other viruses inside that might influence your phenotypes. So we can take the, um, the host cell and infect it with the virus if we make it immune deficient and show that the same phenotype happens just because of that infection. Uh -huh. okay. We can take a, a isogenic strain, one that's infected and one that's not infected, oh, okay. and yeah. we see the result just from the infected cell. All right. So we can link it to that virus. All right. You're right. They have all kinds of other viruses in them, but yeah. that experiment told us that it would link directly to the SSD. Okay. And so if we, you would work with some other viruses, would you expect same uh, same observations, same phenotypes, and... Uh, results, like interaction-wise, or do you yeah, think it's like very virus-specific? Yeah, so that's a great question, and we've been working on looking at how other, S whether other SSVs and other types of viruses have this response, and so far, we've, for the ones that we've looked at, we've found that the other SSVs in that family of viruses have that phenotype, whereas the other viruses, like the SIRV, do not. So if, you, mm -hmm. if you couldn't activate an SIRV, you'd see that it was not, that it didn't cause dormancy. Yeah. So it might be specific to this type of virus. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's not particular to this variant of this type of virus. <laughs> yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah, thanks. Cool. Any other questions? John, John Baladventi did ask, who is the, um, on your tree, you oh. had a eukaryote wearing sunglasses? That's Maria. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> right, we cleared up who the eukaryote is. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. This has been illuminating, and we'll look forward to seeing uh, where, where this research goes. I think it will be very stimulating for, for other people who are especially trying to test how their, how their bugs are dealing with viruses. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, thanks for your contribution. Okay, we'll see everybody later. Okay, so blue cough.